Well, there's just something really special about being able to open to Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4. Most of you are thinking we're going to be talking about giving on Mother's Day. So you put those two together, that's, that's what we have in front of us. If you have your Bible, I want to encourage that you make your way to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 1 through 4, right there in the Sermon on the Mount. I want to encourage you while you're making your way that remember that we were right near this text not that long ago in the verses that follow about prayer from the Sermon on the Mount. So I'd like to go ahead and, and read these verses. If you'd like to read along, it'll be on page 859 if you're using one of the church Bibles somewhere near you. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. God's Word says this, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be applauded by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you give to the poor... Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father in heaven who sees in secret will reward you. Let's pray. Father, I am so, so thankful for the instruction of your word, for how you lead and guide us, Lord, how you provide reward to us richly, and you even tell us how to how to obtain that as we live for you. God, I am thankful for these beloved brothers and sisters, even dealing with some, some sadness. So we've had a pretty heavy week, the loss of another dear sister. Lord, I'm just asking for your comfort, especially, Lord, from your word. And Lord, I have a hard text to preach. So I'm asking for your help. I'm asking that you would help it to penetrate the places that it needs to penetrate, that we would be transformed by your word, not conformed to this world, but conformed to your mind and your will and your heart and your ways. So, Lord, not only am I asking for your blessing and your help to speak through me in the preaching, but I'm asking for your blessing and your help to those who hear, that we'd be spirit-filled hearers this morning. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, many years ago... When I was first, first in ministry, I was meeting regularly with this poor college student. He was a new Christian, and he was working on a lot of things theologically, just working through stuff. And every time we'd meet together, he uh, would order the most expensive coffee drink. Usually we would sit down for coffee, and he would usually order a muffin or a pastry or something in addition, which was always bought with my church card on the blessing of the church's hospitality budget, right? What a wonderful gift that the church could be hospitable where I could sit with this, this young man. But for one meeting, he had let me know that he had a major issue, a major theological issue. He'd been Googling and studying, and, and now he had a major problem with tithing and church giving. And so this was going to take some time, so we decided to meet at a popular Tex-Mex salad place, and so we went there, and the line was really long, which sometimes it is. And while we're standing in line, he is he's just telling me at this point that he had concluded that any money that was given to the church or in any aspect of giving was all just Old Testament. That was for the Old Testament. And any pastor of any church who argued for tithing or for giving or collected an offering was, in his words, fleecing the flock. And they were just sinful hucksters, he told me. He told me this as he was getting more expensive meat upgrades on his meal, and as he was adding the extra guacamole and the extra stuff and the smothered and all the extra stuff that you know makes these meals a little bit more expensive. I walked up to the register, and I paid for my meal, and I walked to the table. And behind me, there was this large ruckus going on as he was trying to explain to the person at the register that he had no money and he had every expectation that I was going to pay for his meal. Now, before you think that I'm totally heartless, I, I do want you to know I did go back 
And I did let him know that the good and faithful members of his church were going to buy his lunch with their faithful tithes and offerings, even though their pastor was a sinful huckster. (laughs) The challenge that comes with any passage of Scripture that deals with money is that God's word pokes at America's greatest idol. All of us idol worshipers get a little uneasy when this particular topic of money and giving come up. But we don't want to be a church that avoids the difficult and hard topics just because the Bible makes us a little bit uncomfortable. We don't want to be that church. Therefore, I want to challenge all of us to hit pause on our assumptions and all the things we have rolling around in our head this morning and actually let the Bible speak to us. That's my goal. And I pray that it transforms us. And I'm going to put your mind at ease right now and let you know, although maybe one of those assumptions is is one I hear often, oh, you pastors always ask for money. I'm not going to ask you for any money in this sermon. And I'm not going to challenge you in such a way that's coming from me. We're just going to open up God's Word, and I'm going to let the Holy Spirit work on that. Okay? Okay. So today, we're looking at Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And actually, this is not a command of Christ to give. Believe it or not, that's not what this text is even about. Not at all. Uh, this is not a sermon to ask you to give. We want to match the point of the text, and the text is about how you give. And just like the very next section of Scripture here that we dealt with a couple weeks ago is not a command to pray but actually an instruction about how you pray. And then the following text after that is not a command to fast, but instructions about how you fast. So from the Bible this morning, I hope that we see that Christians enjoy the richness of giving when we give the way God instructs us to give. There is blessing to be enjoyed there. Sadly, many prosperity gospel preachers and bizarre internet posts and things, have made a minefield of this topic. It's just a big dumpster fire. So I'm going to have to do a little bit of pre-work before we can get to Matthew 6, 1 through 4, just to, to unpack some of those things that are just sort of floating in the air. So what we see here is that Jesus assumes that people will be generous with their money when he says, whenever you give, that's in verse 2, it's an assumption, whenever you do this, Giving is assumed in the Bible, but unfortunately it's not often assumed in our hearts. Therefore, I'm going to have to go to the Old Testament. I'm going to have to look at some things in the New Testament. I'm even going to deal with this tithe, which means 10%. There's a lot of debate there before I'm going to get to what he's talking about here. So let's, let's go ahead and take that little journey for a minute. The very first place we see any kind of giving or offering from the created back to the creator is in Genesis 4, verses 2 through 5. That's when both Cain and Abel gave a portion of their crops and livestock back to God. That's where we see it. That's where it starts. Now, this is something very different than what we see Noah doing when he offers a burnt offering after the flood when he gets out in Genesis 8, 20. In Noah's situation, he's offering this blood sacrifice from specific clean animals that God gave him and told him to bring for the purpose of doing something different than what Cain and Abel were doing. See, Cain and Abel were offering something, a portion of the fruits of their labor. They were giving back something that had had come about because of the work that they were doing. And then in Genesis 14, so we're not very deep into the Bible here. Genesis 14, we read about Abraham giving a tenth or a tithe, sort of depending on how, uh, what translation you have. He gave a tenth of everything to this mysterious priest king named Melchizedek, while Melchizedek was providing wine and, and bread. This is the first place in the Bible where we see the tenth or the tithe. Abraham's giving predates the law of Moses. You know, and it's there where we find commands, law, 
that instructs about a tenth of the proceeds of our labor and our work, usually crops grown. God has provided the growth, we give back a tenth. That's what we see in verses like Leviticus 27.30, or Numbers 18.21, or Deuteronomy 14, verses 22 through 29. That's where we see the law of giving a tenth. But that came later, so how did Abraham know to do this before the law was given? Abraham predates the law. How did he know? Genesis 26.5 says, Abraham listened to God and kept God's mandates, commands, statutes, and instructions. I'm not positive how, but Scripture makes it clear that he heard from the Lord, and he followed the Lord, and he obeyed the Lord. And it wasn't even just Abraham. This isn't a one-off situation of somebody who tithed in a unique situation. Because Jacob, when he decided to commit himself to being a follower of God, he said these words in Genesis 28, 20 through 22. This is what he said. If God will be with me and watch over me during this journey I'm making, if he provides me with food to eat and, and clothing to wear, and if I return safely to my father's family, then the Lord will be my God. This stone that I have set up as a marker will be God's house, and I will give you a tenth of all all that you have given me. Very interesting. Now Jacob's giving a tenth. Hmm. The young man that I was having lunch with, so his argument was that Jesus fulfilled the law, so Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy's instructions about giving a tenth were no longer relevant for him. But the examples of giving that I just mentioned predate the law. They come before that. So just like marriage and the Sabbath, there's more to it than the fulfillment of the law. We don't just scrub away marriage. It predates the law. So does giving. Furthermore, we need to see that even this thing that predates the law and then things that are in the law are important to God in some way. So even though Jesus fulfilled all those things, we know that God does not want us to be murdering people. We don't use that as an excuse to say, well, that was in the law and Jesus fulfilled it, so here I go. These things in the law were still and are still important to God. And they predated the law, so this thing carries out, and then it even carries forward into the New Testament. It, the author of Hebrews in the New Testament is clear that Jesus is better than the prophets and Jesus is better than the law and yet the author of Hebrews still seems to support this idea of giving to God maybe even an actual tithe or a 10% in Hebrews 7.1 where the author discusses, wow, that mysterious Melchizedek again. He's showing this character and he's, he's praising Abraham for his faithfulness for giving a tithe to him. Now, the point of the passage is not about giving. I want to be clear about that. The point of the passage is that he's this mysterious priest king. There's something there about faith, and yet the author of Hebrews speaks highly about Abraham's faithful giving, and Hebrews provides no sign that giving has ceased. In one letter, Paul devotes two chapters of his letter to offering financial help to help the work of the gospel proclamation and the mission of God. That's in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Two chapters given over to this idea. Now, there are some who will argue that, well, those two chapters were about you know, taking up a collection for the ministry work that wasn't in the local church, that was, was happening over there, and so, so therefore it's not about offering in the local church. And, and there is truth to that. That's true. That text is about an offering and a collection for something else. But, if it's your conviction that we give to mission work somewhere else, fine. But by all means, please do that. Most of the time when I hear people say, well, we don't have to take up an offering in the local church because this is about something else, they're not giving to the something else. So if you believe that, give generously to the mission work elsewhere. This is not a free pass for you not to give just because 
That's pointed to some mission work elsewhere. But also, don't overlook the mission work that's happening right where you live. If it's about giving to the proclamation of the gospel and supporting the work of God, don't overlook all that right here in your own community and even the work of your local church. And don't overlook the rest of the New Testament, only going to the scriptures that are convenient for you, and then missing things like supporting the work in the church that you're actually a part of, or supporting the work right where you are, Matthew 10.10, Jesus sends out his disciples and fully expects that their support will come from the very people they're preaching to. Jesus has every expectation. And if they won't support those people, Jesus says, move on. 1 Timothy 5, verses 15 through 16, is among a host of passages in the New Testament talking about taking care of the widows who can't care for their own needs in the church. And then the next two verses right after that, 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 18, go on to instruct the local church to financially support the elders, especially who labor in teaching and preaching, in the local church. You see, Christians Christians are supposed to be giving. It's just expected in some capacity. Wait a minute, what about the law, though, and that being fulfilled? And what about this business about a tithe or about a tenth? Is it, is it supposed to be just, just a tenth? And is that, you know, is that gross or net? And, and how do we, what do we do? And what about other things? Okay, stop. Let's not split hairs and make the tithe a f- matter of first importance. Let's not do that. Matthew 23, 23, Jesus blasts the Pharisees for doing this. He gets pretty mad. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You pay a tenth of mint, dill, and cumin, and yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These things you should have done without neglecting the other. You see what's being said there? Jesus warns that doctrine is important. This faithful living is important, but not all doctrines are equal. He's showing us that there are some that are more important or of first importance. So whatever your conviction is on the tithe, whether it's a specific 10% or or not or something else, it's important to remember that the weightier matters of God's Word must come first. But let's not bag on these guys and make jokes about them because they're tithing on their mint and their dill and their cumin. You know why? Jesus said, you should have done these without neglecting the other. So he's saying you still should have been giving on these things, tithing on your stuff, but not neglecting and not making that more important than the rest. Does that make sense? So let's not get this all upside down. Let's not get all wound up about it. All of God's word is important. Some things we need to make sure we're doing even above getting wound up about a tenth or not. But if you got all the other stuff worked out, then go ahead and continue working out exactly the tenth and gross, whatever you want to do. How God leads you that way. Let's just not forget the bigger things. Second, the New Testament shows us that the law that we couldn't keep, written on tablets out there, has been fulfilled in Christ. And so now we have a law written on our hearts. And the bar has been raised really high because of the gift from God of the Holy Spirit that causes us to live more in accordance with God out of our desires and out of our affections rather than the law that's outside of us because the Holy Spirit is changing us. He's changing us from the the inside out so we don't have this burden of the law hanging over us, but instead we have the joy of God inside us. And when that happens... God transforms our heart. We start becoming less selfish. We don't feel the necessity to hoard so much because we know that God provides. In Christ, we become more generous. We have a deeper desire to be joining God in His mission than to be accumulating a kingdom for ourselves, which will not last beyond our lives. The New Testament does not set a specific percentage to give. But it does say we give all that we have and we leverage all that we are to love God. 
Do you think all our heart, soul, mind, and strength excludes our time, talent, and treasure? God says you love him with everything. That includes what's in your wallet, what's on your calendar, what skills he's given you. Passages like Acts 2, verses 43 through 47, or Acts 4, 32 through 37, or Acts 11, 27, shows us what believing, saved, converted men and women who are totally sold out to Christ do with their money. Those are the examples to go to. They're very generous. to Those who have need, they serve the work of the church. The way they give gives us a little sneak peek into their heart. And what we see is this rich joy in the Lord. It's wonderful. Okay, so now that we have the biblical background, kind of got an idea about what the Bible says about giving, we need to now focus our attention back to Matthew 6, 1 through 4, so we can see specifically how we should give and how we should not give. I want to read that again. So look back at that again, Matthew 6, 1 through 4. It says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound the trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be applauded by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret, as your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So here's what's going on here, and this is really cool. Matthew 6, 1 through 18 is the outworking, so all the, not just the first part, but the whole thing all the way through verse 18, is the outworking of the actual command and the actual instruction in verse 1. Giving and how we give, prayer and how we pray, and fasting are all examples that Jesus uses as illustrations, but there actually could be many more. He didn't have to only go to those. He could have gone to many other things we do in the church. Here's the instruction. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. That's the key right there. Those words. To be seen by them. That's making much about yourself. That's making yourself look righteous. It's about being worried or consumed about what other people think about you. And when you do that, then you have your reward right now. Whatever you get from people in that moment, that's all the reward you're going to have from making this all about yourself. And of course, it could be about giving. And it could be about prayer. And it could be about fasting. And it could be about all other aspects of your Christian walk. It could be about how you serve, because you're doing it for the benefit of being seen by others. It could be how you host a Bible study because you're doing it for the benefit of being seen by others. It could be, any, it could be you're putting you know, various proclamation out to the world and bumper stickers on your car and things like that to be seen by others. The point here is that you're, you're thinking about the motivation for giving, for prayer. So what happens is if you... If you if you're looking for just that satisfaction of a handful of likes on social media, big deal. Oh, wow, look at you. Or maybe you're seeking the satisfaction of someone who says, oh, that's so-and-so. She seems like a very religious person. Who cares? Or maybe you really like feeling bigger than your neighbors because you have more dollars than they have and you know they know it and you want them to know it and you're just looking for them to say I sure wish I had as much money as so and so what reward do you get from hearing that how does that have any benefit or reward at all but if that's what you're looking for what does that say about you if that's where you find your your benefit and your your blessing from this life what I mean seriously you see it? I mean, it's, it's, that's the whole reward. That's 
You have your reward, he says, and that's all you get. Sadly, we live in a world that's chasing those things. It's chasing the number of likes, and it's chasing the applaud and praise of man, or the envy, that you want them to envy you. It's meaningless. God says, if you want that, you got it. That's what you get. But it's empty. Why? Because it's here today and it's gone tomorrow. Because we don't have good gifts to give. God has good gifts to give. And also because God is the one that has all the stuff to give. Does this mean that if God has all the stuff, we shouldn't give? No, not at all. Look at verse 2. This is so whenever you give to the poor. This example is specifically about giving alms. And at this point in time, that was something that was done on the Temple Mount or at the, the city gate. The poor people were there. There wasn't a welfare system. There wasn't a safety net. There wasn't a food pantry. There was this alms giving. And it was a very public act because the people who needed alms were there you know, looking for others to give them alms, or there might even be a, a collection box specifically for the alms. So it's very public, but the principle still applies to all of your giving and all of your prayer and all of your fasting and all of our walk of faith. Right? We, we do this in such a way that does not make it about what other people think of us. That is the point here. We do it in ways that are unconcerned with the nonsense of the others around us but is chiefly concerned about what God thinks. Jesus uses hyperbole, this big language about giving, just like he'll go on to do with the teaching about prayer. It's fascinating, if you look at these two, they have the same format and structure, they model each other. right? So he uses this really kind of weird language. He says, you need to do this in such a way that your right hand and your left hand don't know what each hand is doing. How often do you not know what your hands are doing? I mean, some weird, like, you wake up and you're like, was that my arm? Oh, it is my arm. But how often does that happen? Like, that doesn't happen. We, he's trying to make an over-the-top point that if even your own hands don't know, then there is absolutely no possibility all the other people around you are going to know what you're doing. It's just like that go into the closet to pray thing. It's the same thing. This way you cannot make any of this about you gaining some self-righteousness at all. God knows, and that is all that matters. That's it. Don't be concerned about what other people think. Be concerned about what God thinks. And what does God think about your giving? I mean, what, what does God think about your attitude towards giving? What does God think about your faithful generosity? That's what's important. That is what's important. It doesn't matter what I think. It matters what God thinks. Be focused on that. Now, I realize this, this might be a tough question. That's a tough application. We live in a world that idolizes money, that, that uses money literally to bury God and get Him out of the way. That's the, that's the environment we live in, like a fish lives in water. But this text is saying, be concerned about what God thinks. The ultimate model for good and generous giving is God himself. As a creator of all things, and the one who's sovereign over all things, everything belongs to him, every single thing. He gave you the job that you have, he gave you the skills and the ability that you have to do that job. He gave you the place where you live. And he gave you all of your stuff, every last bit of it. Everything you have comes from God. He even gives you breath right now. And he gives you life. Think about this. Right now, he is holding all of your atoms together so that you can live. 
so that you exist. Your very existence is in the hands and control of God. When we get our thinking about this right, when we see God for who He really is, it's a lot easier to give back just some of the stuff He gave us to God out of pure gratitude. To go, wow, thank you, Lord. You gave this to me in the first place. I'm giving it back just to say thank you. Because that's what we seem to see here that Christians do. But here's a real kicker. Even while that's all happening, we still rebel against God. Not only do we bite the hand that feeds us, we also try to kill the one feeding us. We bury him when we rebel against him. We, we try to move him out of place and put ourselves in his place. We forget who God is. We think we know best. And then we stupidly try to replace the very one that's holding our lives together. That's nonsense. This nonsense. Because when we sin against the giver of life, while he's giving us life, he could just simply say, well, you're done. And all of our atoms would fly apart and we'd fly all over the universe and be non-existent anymore. That's in his prerogative while we're sinning against him. But he's gracious. He's a good giver. He's generous. While we were sinning against him and then continuing to sin against him, he gave his only son to die on the cross, to take the punishment that we deserve, so that all who believe in Jesus could have life and have it abundantly and live for him rather than ourselves and be saved. See, God gives. We don't deserve that. God is generous so that we can live. He certainly doesn't have to do any of that. He owes us nothing, but he did. What a good gift. What a blessing. Here's a real kicker. Even while guys were nailing Jesus to the cross, killing him, what was Jesus doing? Asking God to forgive them. What a gift. What a moment. That's a picture of faithful giving. God serves as our example of giving. And when we start to see that and understand it, and we see that God is transforming us, and we, we start to see God's model of giving more and more, and you know what we find in ourselves? That we're being conformed to God's mind. That we're looking more and more like Christ, the good giver. That God is literally changing us from the inside out to look more and more like Him. And we see that, that's evidenced in our attitude towards giving, our heart for giving, our generosity. You want to know how you're being sanctified and transformed? Well, one area you could look to is how you're being generous with the stuff God gave you. And how you're leveraging that for His good and glory and how you're using that to worship Him. That's transformation. We're being conformed to His mind and His will. We really need to see that we don't deserve anything. You know, sometimes I feel like some of the younger generation gets branded as entitled. We're all entitled. We all feel like we're, des- we owed, we're owed something. We're owed nothing. Nothing. God doesn't have to give us anything. He could withhold everything. But when we're transformed and and he starts to change us, even that is a gift from him. Because you wouldn't be transformed. You wouldn't think like that if God didn't give you that gift in that transformation. And so when he starts doing this, all of a sudden we can say, you know what, God, I, I'm all yours. I don't deserve any of this, and, and you're sustaining me and, and blessing me, and you know what, I'm, here, you have it. I'm all sold out. You can have all of me. You can have all of my time. You can have all of my money. You can have all of my abilities because they weren't ever really mine anyway. So how would you like me to steward what you've given me, God? Do with me what you will. And it becomes a joy when you enter into that place and recognize how blessed you really are. When you can genuinely and truly say, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. And live in that. That's where we find our greatest purpose and our greatest joy. And then that act becomes worship. Now we're praising this good giver. 
And that becomes one more way that we're loving God with all of our heart and all of our mind and all of our soul and all of our strength. And then when we get there, it gets a lot easier to give back to God. And we're being transformed in that way, to be, to be generous. It becomes a joy. It becomes not about our, us or ourselves, but about God. And that's a pretty good way to live because when we give by God's instructions and we recognize it in this way, we get to enjoy the very riches of God. Let's pray. Lord, I'm so thankful for your generosity that you would give to sinners like us, that you would transform us, that you would allow us to even encounter a glimpse of what it is to live the way you've called us to live and flourish in that. Lord, I'm thankful for the generosity of the people who've served mission work and the church work here and the proclamation of your word. I'm asking that you would continue to grow us in that generosity because it's all already yours anyway. So help us to, to steward it for your purposes, putting our purposes second, third, and fourth down the line and putting your purposes first as an act of worship and as an act of joy. And God, help us to really rest in the joy of living in the riches that you've blessed us with and the joy of being on mission for you, joining and just giving back what you've already given to us. Thank you, Lord. Continue to transform us out of selfishness and into this beautiful picture that would be a witness to you and a worship of who you are that we could live in with great rest, great comfort, and great joy. Lord, we just thank you thankful for that transformation. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.